BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. The back was arched. Rigid. Help me! It was like she was hovering, floating, maybe six inches over the bed. So I was wrong. Oh, you were close, John. This is all to do with Shirley. What? It's you, my dear. You're the focus. Donald is here because of you. She really frightened me, you know. He said it's always a teenage girl at the centre of it. And I was horrified. Did you feel in danger, Shirley? I think so, yeah. I I thought something horrible was going to happen to us. We were all really scared out of our wits. I, I just can't put it into words. I thought this is going to be the end. We're all going to die. Episode 3. Interview with a ghost. This is a lot for a teenage girl to cope with. It was. Looking back, you know, I was so traumatised by it all. Today, I think they'd put me in care and I'd be taken away from the family. Why do you say that, Shelley? Because I wasn't mad. I thought I was going mad. I was crying all the time, very traumatised. But what you're describing is someone who's very frightened. Oh, yes. Yes. Bloody bastard, I hate him and I hate you, Donald! (coughs) What? It's Chib, Shirley. I I heard flying objects. Oh. Elvis survived. I, I'm, I'm sorry if I upset you. I'm not upset. You do seem a I'm little... I'm bloody up. scared. Surely. It's all fun and games to you. Poncing it around with your pipe and your bag full of ghost-hunting gizmos like a spooky Sherlock Holmes. But this is my life. My family. And now you're saying it's all my fault! I, 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 I didn't... I'm not the focus. Donald attacks everyone and you can't put this one on me. It's not your fault. A poltergeist is like your radio. It needs power and an energy source. You are Donald's battery. No. I think you should leave, mate. Wally. Shirley's right. We're not having this. Come here, girl. I I, I do apologise. Out, please. Just just answer me one thing first. No, you don't have to, Sherlock. Poltergeists follow a pattern. Noises. Then objects moving. The next stage is communication. He's made contact, hasn't he? Yes. Wally, I, 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 I will leave if you want me to, but let me warn you. Donald won't. Well, better tell him what happened next. Next? Our whole world fell apart. You saw heavy pots and pans fly through the air in your room? Yes, yes. I remember that the sheets were coming off and uh, we were tossed about in the bed, you know. It's just got dark outside and I'm sitting in the shed in my garden where I've set up my little home recording studio. And uh, I'm listening back to my interviews with Shirley and I'm just trying to pull together my thoughts on the case, really. And it's hard because objects floating through the air is impossible, right? And what the newspapers call Shirley's levitation. I was floating above the bed. When John pulled me down, I was stiff. But 
I keep listening to her voice and I don't think she's lying. Which leaves some pretty big questions to answer. And then earlier today, I got this message from one of our investigators, Evelyn Hollow. Let me play it to you. Hi, Danny, it's Evelyn. Listen, I think we really need to take a closer look at the NGO Poltergeist case. There's just an alarming number of similarities to the Battersea case. Strange noises, objects moving of their own accord, and really most strikingly, levitation. So the Enfield Poltergeist is a bit of a legend in ghost hunting circles. It's one of the best documented of all hauntings. It spawned various fictional movies, including The Conjuring 2. Um, it takes place in Enfield, a suburb of North London, about 20 years after Battersea, 1977. Like with our case, most of the activity focuses around a young girl, 11-year-old Janet Hodgson. You need to contact a man called Graham Morris. Now, he was the first photographer on the scene, and not only that, he actually claims to have been hit by a flying object. All right, happy ghost hunting, Godspeed. So, I've managed to track Graham down. I'm going to talk to him now. He, he's a sensible, sporty-looking man in his 60s. Back in 1977, he was working for the Daily Mirror newspaper. You as a man who normally goes out and photographs very real life events, what, what, what did you actually think you might be asked to do? I would absolutely no idea. I think I'd feel quite scared though if I was walking into a place where objects might be flying around and I had to photograph them. I was, I was scared, not so much of the objects flying around, I put up with that, but it's just, I was scared of the fact that I was about 20 something years old. And there am I being told to go into a, to a house in the dark on my own with whatever this was. I have absolutely no idea what was going on. I put myself right back into a corner so I could see as much of the room as possible. The wide angle lens, flash, all the rest of it. So there's nothing happening at all. But as the family came in, the children were being carried by the adults. Um, Janet seemed to be last one in. And as she was brought in, Suddenly, wow, here we go. <laughs> just things started flying. Just things are whizzing around the room. It was, well, I've just never seen anything like it. It was just tiny things, really. The kids' toys or, or you know, bits and pieces of so ashtrays around. There were cups and saucers. There were things that would move. But there were lots of Lego bricks everywhere. As there would be in any kid's house. And these were taking off and flying. I got hit in the head, I hit in just above the eyebrow by a corner of a, only a little Lego brick, but it must have been going at such speed, it gave me a lump for about four days. It was unbelievable. This is what I've been most intrigued to ask you about, I think. It, it's seemingly impossible, isn't it? So how do you, as a rational human being walking into the situation, how do you process that? Well, it is just something that's happening. It's only afterwards when you stop and think that suddenly this sort of tsunami hits you and you think, wow, what was that all about? And when you look back at the photos, did they capture what you witnessed of objects flying through the air? Well, no, in a way. <laughs> Story of my life. You can only take so many pictures at a time. You've got a flash gun that's recharging. You could take one picture every few seconds. Never mind, it didn't take it away from you know what actually happened and what I saw and certainly what I saw over the months to come. Were you trying to work out in your head how it happened? You know, the obvious logical thing is that somebody's doing it, but I'm watching the kids. They're screaming, they're crying. They're not doing it. This was just happening in the in the room around them, and they were they were terrified. After the Daily Mirror runs their story, the Enfield case attracts nationwide attention, and one of the next reporters on the scene is Ros Morris, no relation to Graham a BBC Radio 4 reporter. The first thing, when I first went there, um, there was this knocking on the walls, and it was definitely there, and I recorded it, and as far as I know, this is the first, it was the first broadcast of poltergeist activity. We began to hear knocking sounds at about 10.30, and they appeared to be coming from the floors and walls of the upper part of the house. This is what they sounded like when they started. See? <laughs> I 
feel like we're not just hearing that strange moment in 1977, but also maybe what the noises in Shirley's house sounded like in Battersea 20 years before. I know there were quite a few people in the house at the time. Are you sure? Can you be absolutely certain that none of those people were, were responsible for it? It seemed to me that it was not being generated by anyone in the house because if they had done, you would have known where it was coming from. Um, you would have been... And, and it, it, felt, it felt as though it was coming from outside the house and banging on the walls, um, trying to get in. This is a woman that Ros interviewed, Hazel Short. She's a road crossing attendant or lollipop lady at the school opposite the Hodgson's house. And on December the 15th, 1977, her attention is drawn to the window of Janet's bedroom. All of a sudden I saw the middle girl, Janet, going up and down in front of the window. Well, I thought that she was jumping up and down off the bed. But when I looked, she was horizontal, going up and down with her arms and legs going everywhere. And I, I suppose this about half a dozen times. And then it stopped. It was frightening. Even in the crazy world of poltergeist cases, reports of levitation are incredibly rare. It features in less than 10% of reported cases. But here we have Janet in 1977 and Shirley in 1956, both supposedly floating. When I listened to the interview with Shirley in our case, and when I listened to the interviews you conducted, I don't feel those people are lying. I mean, when well, you were talking to them, did you feel that they were credible? Did you believe them? Yes, I did. And that was because it wasn't just the family who were saying these things. There were lots of other people, neighbours and people who had no interest in it at all. The child appeared to float half around the room and uh, the, the child's arm banged against the, the window frame twice. And I, I was frightened that, she, that she, the force that she banged against it, you know, that the window frame would, would have gone. So I fully expected it to drop into the, into the road. I talked to Graham Morris, the first photographer in there, and he feels that he was hit by a Lego brick, a flying Lego brick. Do you think that Lego brick was thrown by a poltergeist or by a human being? Well, I don't think it was thrown by a human being because Graham said it wasn't. And I don't think that a Fleet Street photographer is someone who's going to say that unless they think it's the case. It's quite mind-blowing, isn't it? As soon as you allow that thought to come into your head, you have to reassess everything you believe about the world. Yes, I mean, that's what's disturbing about it. This was the weirdest story that I've ever had to cover as a, a, a reporter. And after I'd done the Radio 4 documentary about it, people did say to me, oh, I suppose you'll specialise in this stuff from now on. And I said, oh, no, I never want to go near this ever again, because I found it really disturbing. It was there was something about it. It's just so strange and out of the ordinary and, and puts you on edge. Talking to Ros and Graham has left me with as many questions as answers. One thing's for sure though, the stories that emerged from Enfield turned Janet into an unwitting celebrity. And back in 1956, the same thing is about to happen to Shirley. It's not Donald, it's the front door. They're everywhere. Oh, no, just me. There's no hope now. The whole blessed universe knows. Kitty, John, there's journalists everywhere. They had heard the story, the police. Some journalists got hold of the reports and then it just snowballed. Everybody wanted to see the haunted house. Yeah, Shirley's private spook gets rough. Look, look, look at this rubbish they're writing. Vivaciously attractive 15-year-old Shirley Hitchens was thrown out of bed last night. Well, at least they're being nice. Not about me. It's got me down as 50. Cheek. There must be about 40 of them out there. Shirley, get away from that window. Not just journalists either. Half of the streets come to gulp. I popped to the shops earlier and heard some kids talking about the spooky house. Oh, God, we'll be a laughing stock. Uh, they're not laughing. 
You can see people cross the road when they reach us. They're scared. Oh, it's not fair. We're just an ordinary family. We didn't ask for this. Well, there's only one thing for it. Close the curtains, lock the door and get the kettle on. This is it, Donald. You wanted attention, you've got it. Happy now. These days, we're quite used to ordinary people becoming celebrities through reality TV and X Factor, things like that. But I guess this was quite unusual back then for you and your neighbours, that suddenly here was the girl at number 63. Front page news. Oh, yes, I couldn't poke my head out the door because if I went out, I think at one time I asked my mum if I could go two doors down to my friend Doreen. Bye, Mum. See you later. When I went out and had to just walk down the road. I got halfway and all the press were around me, all, all asking, oh, hello, Shirley, oh, let's stand there. And they were snapping photographs. And I just turned around and run back indoors and in tears. And mum said, what's wrong? I said, oh, there's loads of men out there. <laughs> and uh, dad went out. I, I couldn't handle it. Clear off. Go on, leave her alone. She's a kid for Pete's sake, go on. But they camped out there all night. They don't give up. We're surely in bed. Yeah, I'll go and check her now. No, I'll go. There he is. He doesn't give up either. I don't know who's worse, kid. Him or them. Both after our little girl. Donald, are you there? I can feel you. Give me a sign. Where are you now? Under me. <laughs> Stop it. Why are you here, Donald? Do you want something? One knock for no, two for yes. Is it me? You can't trust him, child. Nan! I nearly wet myself. How long have you been standing there? Long enough. I can't sleep. All them reporters outside. This has to stop, girl. How? I can't control him, can I? Can't you? I saw your grandfather once at the foot of my bed. As solid and real as when he was alive. Oh, Nan. When you want something bad enough, you can will it into being. I don't want Donald. I wish he'd go away. There's not a bit of you that likes the attention. Fellas queuing up to take your picture. Your own private spook. No. Sleep, child. They'll be back to banging on the door in the morning. Nan? Was it nice? Seeing Grandad again? It wasn't him, child. Who was it then? The same thing you were speaking to. He takes many guises, but his aim is the same. It's time for this to end, child before it goes too far. I want to know more about your grand, Shelley. She seems like quite a character. She smoked a pipe. She was a big woman, because when she died, she had to have a bigger coffin, because she was about six foot four. She used to throw things. I remember once she had an argument with my auntie up in, because she had a kitchen upstairs. She threw a whole pot of hot tea. That's the type of temper she had. She was quite fiery, my gran. In the war, apparently, she stayed in London in the house and she used to go up on roofs fire watching. If anybody could brave the German bombers, 
It'd be Ethel. Oh, yes. Oh, she wasn't going to be beaten by Hitler. Oh, no way. <laughs> Dear Lord, protect this family from evil. Watch over us as we are in our hour of need. And keep a special watch on Shirley. She needs you most. <gasps> Amen. So she wasn't scared of Hitler. But what about Donald? She was very scared. She was proclaiming that it was evil and that it's all going to get us, you know. <laughs> yeah, she, oh, she swore at it and she used to say it's the work of the devil and that made us all more scared. This is a time, Shirley, when you're struggling to find your own identity. You're a teenager trying to work out who you are and there's this huge gang of journalists outside your house telling you you're possessed. Your grandmother is saying this is something to do with the devil. That must have really messed with your brain. It did. Oh, it did. Did you start to think that you were cursed? Yes, because everyone said I was doing it and that I was the poltergeist girl. And I thought, well, it must be me. There's something wrong with I'm ill. There's, I think I said to my dad, there's something wrong with me, isn't there? So, you know, I'm going to die or something like that. Talking to Shirley makes me think of Enfield again and Janice Hodgson. I think it's time to catch up with our parapsychologist, Evelyn Hollow. Why do people think that teenage girls are so often at the heart of these cases? So Guy Playfair, who is a very well-known paranormal investigator, was involved with the Enfield case. And he once described poltergeist activity as a kind of football game of energy. He said that when people get into conditions of you know, tension, they exude a kind of energy and the kind of thing that happens to teenagers at puberty because it's a, you know, it's a turbulent time in their life. And he says, along come a couple of spirits and they do what any group of schoolboys would do. They begin to kick it around, smashing windows and generally creating havoc. Uh, then they get tired and they leave it. There's a theory then that these are ghosts who latch onto the teenager, almost in a kind of vampiric way that they're feeding off their energy. Yes, there's sort of an idea that spirits are seen as possessive and abusive in poltergeist cases. And historically, women endure this behaviour from actual human partners at an alarming frequency. The sceptic counter-argument might be that Janet and Shirley were possessed not by a spirit, but by the pressures of living up to the huge press interest in their case. Young girls trapped in a ghost story that's spinning out of their control. Right, milk. That's almost wished me life to get it. Cultures. Going to have to talk to him eventually. No, not on your Nelly. It's been days now, Dad. They're not going anywhere. Why don't you invite a couple of them in? Give them an interview and then let them take a few pictures. Might be enough. He's got a point, Well, Today's newspapers, tomorrow's fish and chip papers. Uh, what do you think, Mum? I think you're opening a flipping great Pandora's box. <laughs> huh? And he agrees. Shirley? I think it's okay. If we get to tell our side of the story, maybe someone out there might even be able to help. Evelyn, if we go with this idea for a moment that Donald is a spirit, somehow feeding off Shirley, why? Why is it happening? The belief would be that there is an entity, an entity that has some form of consciousness, and therefore it has an agenda. So it starts with knocking, banging, tapping, and then it escalates to moving small objects, and then it eventually escalates to creating an incredible racket, such as throwing pots and pans. And we would say that it wishes to communicate. So you're saying that all these things that we've been talking about, the objects flying, the girls levitating, that's not random chaos. It's something trying to make contact. Imagine a person who needs your attention and you can't hear them or they're unable to, to talk or maybe talk in your language. What are you going to do? You might start banging on a desk or throwing things to get their attention. The idea is that it wants to talk to them. Right, so, Shirley, this is uh, Ronald Maxwell, Daily Mail. Joyce Lewis, South London Advertiser. Hello. Thanks awfully for letting us in. This all seems jolly interesting. For you, maybe. Our readers love a good ghost story. Ghost? We don't really know what it is yet. Why don't you tell us what's been happening? 
Well... Tell them about the clock. It slides off the shelf, glides across the room and lands on the table. That happened once? Several times. Dad said, whoever's doing this, do it again. And it did. Gracious. You actually saw this? Mm, yeah, with my own eyes. How is that possible? You tell me. What about this levitation? People are saying Shirley flew around the room? Uh, that, that's complete rubbish. Oh. She was just floating above the bed. We tried to pull her down, but Donald wouldn't let her go. Donald? That's what we call him. He answers to it. Pardon? When we talk to him, we call him Donald, and he replies. You talk to it? How? Shirley. He bangs on the walls, so we told him to answer us that way. Uh, she's got like, a code. One tap for no, two for yes. Can we try it now? Right. That is enough for me. It's just a bit of fun, Ethel. It's sinful. It's what it is. The Lord said it loud and clear. Do not let your people call forth the spirits of the dead. If you don't want to, we understand. But our readers, they would love to make contact. There's no guarantee that it'll come. And when he does, it might not even make any sense. Remember, one knock for no, two for yes. Shall we? Go on, then. Me? <laughs> Hello. It's Joyce Lewis from the South London Advertiser. Are you there? Donald? <gasps> it's like it came from inside the table. Ask him something else. Are you evil? No. Shame. Our readers love an evil spirit. Do you mean Shirley any harm? <laughs> no. Can we help you in any way? That was a yes. Was it you who put the key on Shirley's bed? Is it you who throws things? Will you do it again? Are you...? Wait. How old is Shirley? You've stamped him. Bang on, Donald. Good God. What? What are we talking with? Donald, are you in love with Shirley? Uh, uh, maybe that's enough. Oh, hold on. You ask him something, Shirley. Um, all right. Donald, are you going to behave tonight? Oh dear. Donald, I'm being serious now. No more games. Me, my mum and dad. Shirley. Nan, John, all of us. We don't want to be famous. Not like this. And we're scared, so please. Will you go away? What does that mean? No. 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 Next episode on the Battersea Poltergeist. Pray for Shirley. Surround her with power and love and light. Can an exorcism be dangerous? Very. Even myself, I've got a case where a, a young lady sat on fire in front of me. We are coming for you, Donald. We will not let you have this girl.
Who or what is Donald? I want to hear your theories and questions on the case. Email me on batterseapoltergeist at bbc.co.uk or find me, Danny Robbins, on social media. Together, let's solve this mystery. Hello, did you know that in a million years there'll be no more total solar eclipses because the moon is gradually moving away from the earth? Or that during China's cultural revolution people were arrested for bourgeois habits like keeping a pet or wearing tight trousers? I'm Melvin Bragg and those are two of the extraordinary things I've learned while presenting the latest series of In Our Time. Each week I ask three expert academic guests to break down and illuminate everything from quantum gravity to the nature of humanity, from Confucius to Augustus, from Beowulf to Baudica. So if you're curious about the world around you or you simply want to win your next general knowledge quiz, subscribe to In Our Time on BBC Sounds.